Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker is well known uh, and highly regarded in our in, in the Philippine business landscape. In 1959, he received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physical Science at the University of the Philippines, Kiliman, Kansas City. In the following year, he received his Bachelor of Science degree in Geology from the same university. He then went on to Stanford University, where in 1963, I hope you don't mind me saying this day, but I think he's still a very young man. He then went to Stanford University, where in 1963, he received his master's degree, and in 1965, his PhD in geology with focus on geochemistry. He is also a candidate of, uh, for a degree of the master's of economics. His numerous business roles, and this reads like chapter in the Bible, the Bible of the mining industry. I'm sure he's written many chapters. <laughs> he is president of Monte Oro Resources and Energy Incorporated. He is president of Atok Big Wedge Company Incorporated. Chief Executive Officer of Forum Energy PLC. Director of ISM Communications Corporation, Chairman A. Brown Company. But let me just give you a flavor of where he's been. Also, let you know what his past positions were. He was former president and chief executive officer of the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines that has brought you all the electricity. He was also formerly associated with the following listed companies, either as a director or as its president. Felix Mining Corporation, Felix Gold, Felix Petroleum, Philippine Realty and Holdings Corporation, Philo Drill Corporation, Petro Energy Resources Corporation, Dominion Asia Equities Incorporated, Palawan Oil and Gas Exploration, Seven Seas Oil Company, Universal Petroleum, Sinophil Corporation, Asian Petroleum Corporation, Akohe Mining Corporation, Semirara Coal Corporation, Surigao Consolidated Mining or Suricon, Vulcan Industrial and Mining Corporation, San Jose Oil, Seafront Petroleum, and Basic Petroleum. Get my drift. He was also technical director of Dragon Oil PLC, a company that was listed that is listed in the London Stock Exchange. He is also chairman of various non-listed corporations. A. Brown Energy and Resources Development Inc., Shellac Holdings Corporation, and Wapco Management Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, to speak to us on the topic, the Philippine mining industry prognosis and possibilities. It is my honor to present a highly regarded member of our business community, a respected leader in the energy and mining sectors, my friend, Dr. Walter Brown. Well, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, let me thank, begin by thanking the organizers for this opportunity of speaking before such a distinguished group of people in the mining industry. But first of all, let me explain two things. One, I have a junior author here who actually has done 80% of, or 90% of the work, Jun Yumo here. And I brought him in to help work this thing out because he was instrumental in the early stages of forming EO 79, no? So he can, he gave me a, a background which I will use in the talk. 
so that we can understand where the government is coming from. No? Because one of the things that's essential in order to deal with the problem which we face today is to understand the opposition, where it came from, what its motivations are. And the, well, the thing I would like to emphasize here is we are in a very unusual situation now. The other thing I'd like to explain, which is related to this, is the reason I changed the topic of the talk, which originally was responsible mining. I don't think responsible mining is an issue. Responsible mining is admitted to by the government as something greatly to be desired. It's the definition of what is responsible mining and what is acceptable mining. The other thing I'd like to emphasize is that I appreciate the efforts that the people in the industry have been taking to combat the situation, but I feel that we need to be much more perceptive and much more sophisticated in our dealings with government today. If you want to ask me the prognosis of the Philippine mining industry, as of this day, all new projects are dead. Is there any hope of survival of, of new applications being approved? I would say you will have to wait for at least three years. Then you not only have to wait for at least three years, you're going to have to do a lot of work, and I'd like to spend a great deal of my talk on the account, what work you have to do. But it's got to be from a different perspective. We cannot go forward on the basis that our opposition are a bunch of ignorant, ill-informed, unrealistic people. And I'll tell you why I can say that. As one of my activities, which wasn't mentioned, I am on the, I'm vice chairman of the Board of Trustees of Xavier University in Cagayan de Oro, which is part of the Ateneo system. The author of the recent Ateneo paper on uh, the mining industry, which is actually one of the pillars of government policy today, is Father Jet Villarino, no? who is a personal friend, and I've known him for since he came to Atene de Cagayan, which was about six years ago. I know Father Tabora, who was the head of the uh, uh, Atene de Davao, whom people in the mining industry there don't look with great favor upon. The new member of the Supreme Court, Marivik Yonin, who, who is in the room next door, whom some of you know. Let me tell you, I don't agree with him, but he's a very intelligent, very articulate person. What, what am I driving at? The situation today is very different from the situation we faced before. Before we were facing a ragtag uh, conglomeration of, you might say, NGOs, people's organizations, etc. Now we are facing a very disciplined, intelligent, highly motivated, and respected group of individuals who happen to disagree with us on certain issues. There's nothing to be gained by attacking them. There's nothing to be gained by saying that, they are, that if we don't use metals, uh, we can't have any, any of the finer things of life. They all know that. But they also know that it is not essential that these, all of these be derived from the Philippines. Also the statement that the Philippines economy will collapse if we don't uh, encourage mining is, is no longer true because we have reached a level of economic development where there is, it's a matter of choice. It's true, and I agree, that the Philippine mining industry can be the bulwark of the progress of the future and, will, and should be. I mean, I'm fully on board with you guys on that. But to insist that things will fall apart, nothing will happen if it's not developed, is not true. It's a matter of choice. And the Philippines will survive because of its other resources. So we have to go on the basis of certain things which will come, become apparent as we go through the talk. Now, I've gone through the, I've gone through the, can we have the next slide please? No. You can see here that there is a very small, uh, picture of the development of the mining industry. And the objective of this is to make you aware that the situation has developed over time. In the early days of martial law, where we had this small scale mining act, the mining act, and even after martial law, well, during martial law days there was no problem. We had a highly centralized government. If you got to the powers that be, 
you got your permits, and that's why this was the heyday of Philippine mining. In the period after that, you had a hiatus of, of low metal prices and very, what do you call it, very negative ideas. Then you had the Mining Act, you have Mark Copper spill, you have various things, decent spill, rapu rapu. Then you have the PMRC, you have the Supreme Court ruling and the Mining Act. But now today we are faced with the Felix tailing spill, which, you know, I, it happened to me when I was chairman of Felix. And this is, a, this is going to be a major contention, uh, point I will deal with later on in the talk. Because the government is coming out with a ridiculous proposition that, or I'm, maybe I shouldn't be that vocal, but I've already said it. <laughs> that force majeure does not exist. No. Our problem though is a problem that faces the entire industry. And this is the fact that we cannot make rational decisions if we don't have the basis. And the only basis in the future will be facts and standards. The problem is in the absence of standards, which are acceptable to government, we will always be in a state of argument, indecision, and which will be a barrier to progress. So the very focus that of the whole talk is to in invite you and the rest of the industry and the whole country as a whole to come to some agreement on standards. Now, to, to give you a flavor of the development of the of the problem or opportunities as faces today, let's look at the next slide. No. We look at issues and drivers. What are the drivers? They are the civil service, uh, society organizations, the NGOs, the people's organizations. Those, those were the first. Those were the people that were giving us problems in the past. They continue to give us problems, but they are minor compared to the problems we have today. The second driver, I think, was the Ateneo study on mining, which I will deal with in a few minutes. Then I'd like to say that there's the, the latest one, which is House Bill 3763. Have any of you seen this yet? As you will see later, you'll be horrified when you see what's pending in the House of Representatives. No. And this is another point I'd like to make. I don't think the mining industry has been active enough in working with the legislature. It is true that the perception in the past of the industry was every time you talk to them, there are costs which you don't like to pay. But they are an essential part of our government. And unless we do more work with the legislature, we're in deep trouble. And then I'd like to deal with the IMF study which is the very basis for actually one of the basis for the government position. No? Now, let's just go rapidly over the issues that have been raised by the civil service society, so, so, uh, organizations, the NGOs, and the people's organizations. And rather than dealing with the individual ones, I think the best summary of them was given by Christian Monsod in a paper he wrote in late this year. No? And he said, should mining be allowed in the Philippines? And of course, he said it can be done with the following minimum conditions. There must be a full accounting of the environmental, social, economic cost. The government must receive full and full share of the resource value. Institutional capabilities must be put in place and new capital must be created for the rural areas. The problem though is, I don't think there's anybody in this room that will disagree with the statements of policy. The problem is, putting a number on it and making sure that the numbers are achieved. And that's the problem that we face today. Now, in the past, the government had the institutional capability to evaluate and regulate mining. This was in the early days. Now, due to the lack of technical people and even the lack of political will, to my mind, they do not have the, cap the capability to evaluate and regulate mining. In fact, well, so if this is the case, there are no standard resource and environmental evaluations. The capacity for resource management is wanting. 
and then in, added to that the enforcement of laws and policies inadequate. And I will, this is illustrated by the recent, uh, the article in the newspaper this morning about the deaths in Parakali, Parakali district. This is a good example of the situation which faces us today, faces the government, and the government so far has not shown its capability of dealing adequately with the issues. It's an open secret that everybody that has access to the mining industry knows who the illegal miners are, where they're operating. And yet at the same time, nothing is done about it. So my friends in the mining industry, before we were, what's that? Confident enough that somebody would do something about it, I'm telling you, unless we do something about it, nobody will. The government has to be pressured to do something about it. And it has to be done from people that understand the situation. And the only people that understand the situation adequately are the mining industry. But we must be able to transfer this knowledge to government, make them appreciate it. Otherwise, I don't see any end in sight to the problem. No. The next one. Well, of course, the sins of the, the various organizations were harping on the sins of the past, the various environmental spills, the fact that LGU taxation did not get to the, to the uh, unit involved. Of course, I, when I was with Felix, I had great problems in understanding why the Demogan Bill was never approved. And the Demogan Bill was to give the excise tax directly to the local government unit involved until I got a very good briefing from Secretary at Chance at that time, Delia no, this, no. He told me, Walter, if the LGUs will get their money directly, they don't have to go through the procedure they're doing now. And what's the procedure they're doing now? They have to get a release from the, the budget department. And in order to get that, since they have no clout on the national level, they have to go to their congressman to lobby with the budget guy to release it. So they owe a debt of gratitude to the congressman. Now what happens if this is eliminated? They, the congressman will lose their political capability. And if the local government unit gets his share, fair share of the allotment, you might be funding the next congressman who will take his place. So it's not politically acceptable. So they say this thing will not pass through Congress unless the situation dramatically changes. No? Now the Ateneo School of Government Policy paper is another thing. Again, I know the people that wrote this. I sit on the board of this with Tony Lavinia, Father Tabora, Father Jet Vidamin. He's not, he's not in Ateneo now, so I no longer see him. But these are honest, sincere, dedicated people. If you look at the, the issues that they sent up, they sent up issues on land use, distribution of benefits, compensation, etc., cost of small scale mining. And these documents are available to everybody. And I would say that if you want to understand their motivations, you read the papers. Because if you don't understand where they're coming from, it's hard to deal with them effectively. And you will appreciate the fact that you're dealing with earnest people that disagree with you. So what do we do? We find the basis for the disagreement and we address it at this. We don't say that they don't understand the industry. We don't say that they don't know what they're doing. We say, where do we disagree? And let's discuss it and let's, let me show you effectively what's wrong with your reasoning and why my, our reasoning is better than theirs. No? So the ne next responsible mining, Next one, what the government should be doing, define policy, etc. The problem here is that I don't think anybody in this room disagrees with any of the observations that have been made by Ateneo. What we disagree with is the solution that they gave. And the solution they gave is since they feel that the government lacks the capacity to define and regulate, things should be brought to a standstill. And that's just what has happened. And the thing is, I'll tell you, this is a personal opinion. 
I do not represent any organization this, and this is shared by Dr. Yumol, that the president's pillar on which he bases it is this Ateneo paper. He knows the people involved. He knows that they're competent, intelligent people. They're not really anti-mining, but they are insisting on standards of performance which we're not capable of delivering on. And to wait for government to do it on its own is, well, maybe the entire ice, ice cap will melt before this happens. No? Now to give you another horror story, House Bill 3763. It changes the concept of the, of the eminent domain in that the ancestral domains do not belong to the government. It defines them as belonging to the ICCs and IPs. It prohibits FTAAs. Private persons cannot do mineral exploration. It is reserved for the Bureau of Mines, and the Bureau of Mines is going to be supervised by the Department of Science and Technology. June Yumel had nothing to do with that. He was there, but he left before this thing came out, no? The maximum area for mineral agreements is 500 hectares, no? Now, this is, and by the way, the tax, the maximum term of contracts is 15 years. The government gets 10% of the gross, but the IPs must also get 10% of the gross. So 20% of the gross is off the top. This will kill most, in most if not all. Community development programs are not royalty payments. They're separate and distinct. Okay, and then the MGB is a scientific institution will regulate the industry. Now, the next one I'd like you to look at rapidly is the IMF study. Why? Because this was the very basis on which there... By the way, Secretary Purisima is for mining, but he wants to get his pound of flesh. The problem is he's not able to define what it is. And the other problem is he has used, asked the IRF to do the study. I don't know if he's read the whole report. I assume he has. But he proposes the approval of one part, but he doesn't read the entire study, which shows that the IMF says that the FTAA is regressive and it's not competitive with other countries' regimes. And what is regressive about it? Because it takes too much off the top. Now, he, the, uh, the IMF uh, presented an alternative where 10% of the gross proceeds of the cash flow before financing charges would be in lieu of some of the royalties. What I'm pointing out is don't we cannot fight the fact that the government will exact, expect for and will ask for more money. But the thing to do is to get together and help them define something that will work and show them what will not work instead of just saying no, no, no and trying to bamboozle them into agreeing. As I said, I can vouch from what I've seen that the president's stance on mining is not based on anything except his observation that he thinks it's the right thing to do. And nobody will influence him to change that view. When he makes up his mind, he digs in his heels and he takes a position. That's why I'm saying to come out with a very strong opposition to it at this point in time is counterproductive. What should be done is to work on the numbers that the rational, more rational oppo oppositors are working on and show them that there is a middle road. For example, they show that, they say that only a certain portion of the income goes to mining. They, they don't relate it to the amount of area. Of course, if you count the total amount that comes in from fisheries, from agriculture, from tourism, and don't relate it to the number of hectares that's involved. Mining does a very poor job, but if you normalize it and compare it to the number of hectares or land that is used, and alternative uses of that specific piece of land, 
then you have something to argue with. But this involves a lot of work. Okay, the, re the rest of the IMF study. There should be only a single royalty applicable board of incentives should be repealed. This is, and there's something, well this is, I'm going very rapidly of the, over this to give us more time to deal with questions later on, no? And to deal with the suggestions of how to deal with. The highlights of it, again, is that full cost of extraction not accounted for, government incapable to do full valuation, the current financial regime is not advantaged. Since of the past, a lot is still unknown. Therefore, moratorium. Now, let's go to the recent events. EO79 and its IRR. By the way, how many of you have read 79 from page by page and uh, word for word? How many? You all should read it. How about the implementing rules and regulations? It's a horror story. I've done it several times. What are the major issues here? Of course, the intent is to increase the government share. However, it doesn't tell you what the government share should be. And how can you ask an exploration company to continue to work on even assuming for purposes of argument that it has a permit if it has no idea of what it's going to pay in the future. Just the only new thing it knows is going to be greater. But is it going to be 20% more, 50% more, 200% more? There is no indication. They should learn the fact that, which is common knowledge to most people, that the thing that businessmen can survive in any sort of regime if they know the rules. EO79 applies the brakes but doesn't set the rules. Protect the environment, ensure consistency among LGUs and, 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 and national government and the constitution. By the way, there are, I'm not a lawyer, but I've been told, and I agree with my soup, that there are some essential constitutional problems that arise out of EO 79 and even the implementing rules and regulations. For ex and the problem is, unless they're resolved, will you, as representatives, let's say, of any major mining company, be it local, or start a, a project when you don't know what your taxation rates will be. If you have an MPS, if you have an existing MPSA, you're saying I'm safe. But if your MPSA is close to the 25th year, you don't know. The normal pr procedure in the past, it would be approved. But it's true that there is no specific uh, wording in the law that says it will automatically be approved under the same terms and conditions upon agreement of both parties. So what's supposing if the government doesn't agree? I'm not enough of a lawyer to know if we'll talk that so many years of precedence, but I think it's an open ground. I'm sure if the case will go all the way to the Supreme Court. Who wants to start a mining project? And I think our friends in Goldfield should take a look at this to see what's going to happen and they should read the World Bank report. Now another component. We go to the EO provisions. Application moratorium, we're all familiar, the FTA is encouraged. We're all, are, you're all familiar with the fact that the abandoned waste ownership provision, that if you have a tailings and you're M, you have tailings that were left there by somebody and you apply a new permit, you don't own the tailings. They belong to the state and you have to bid for it. You are, you, are, you are able to apply for the exploration permit, but you don't know the conditions under which you will operate. You must have an impeccable track record. Now there are 
Are there, there are queries on the EO79 pr provisions, which I was in a forum with the director of mines, and he made the statement that he feels that not only the officers of the corporations that violate the environmental rules can be sued, but also the shareholders. He said that in a forum, there were about 100 people in the room. Can you imagine what this would do?